the Environmental Leadership Chronicles, a podcast brought to you by the California Association of Environmental Professionals. In this episode, we feature Jose Fodipo Memba and Christopher Mundy. Jose is an interim chief diversity officer at SMUD and responsible for company-wide programs and services such as human resources, workforce development, diversity and inclusion, and sustainable communities. His focus is to advocate for diversity, inspire an inclusive culture based on trust and respect, and to create belonging and connection among SMUD's employees, customers, and communities, ultimately resulting in equitable outcomes for all. Chris is the environmental practice group leader and principal at Ascent Environmental. Over the past 22 years, Chris has been managing and preparing environmental analysis documents for a wide variety of projects pursuant to CEQA. His career has been spent in the environmental consulting industry, in addition to serving as in-house staff for the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California between 2002 and 2005. Chris serves the curriculum committees for AEP CEQA Essentials and Advanced CEQA workshops, assisting environmental professionals throughout California to learn and refresh on best practices and emerging trends in the world of environmental planning and analysis. And a note before we jump in, AEP is collecting feedback via survey on its DEI initiative. We ask you to share your experiences with diversity, equity, and inclusion at AEP to help help us better understand our current statewide membership and how we can strengthen DEI within our organization and throughout the environmental profession. June 6th is the final day to complete the survey, and we appreciate your valuable feedback to help us move forward. To show our appreciation, the AEP chapter with the highest rate of submissions will receive funds to be used towards a membership appreciation event. Please check the podcast description for the survey link. Thanks for your support, and we hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, I'm Jessa. And I'm Laurel. And today we've got an environmental leadership twofer. We have Chris from Ascent and Jose from SMUD. We're so happy to have you. Already we're loving your energy. So let's start as we always do. Why don't you guys explain how you're connected to each other and how you're connected to AEP? Chris, you go first. Um, I've been presenting for the AEP workshops for several years uh, and also an AEP member, um, but recently started helping out with the curricula for both the CEQA Essentials and the Advanced CEQA workshops um, and really just kind of enjoying sharing some of that information as well as some of the, the funnier experiences I've, I've had. Um, in terms of my connection to Jose, um, he and I actually started many, many years ago, I think 2005, we started working for the same company that was called EIP Associates. Um, And then that company kind of went under some different ownership and Jose transitioned to SMUD. um, And then I ended up working as a consultant for SMUD. And so we kind of interacted because he was, he was then a client. Um, But then we've also just kind of stayed in touch and and been friends with shared experiences. So I'll turn to Jose. Thanks, Chris. Uh, My connection with AAP, again, it goes back to starting off in this industry back in, I guess, 2003, 2004, and, and starting with the CEQA basics class. Um, I, I came from a, a history background, and, and I knew virtually nothing about CEQA coming into the process. So the class that Chris teaches was essentially how I got involved um, in this industry and, and, and helped develop a career uh, with mentors like Brian Mooney and Brian Boxer and, and a number of other folks. Um, uh, again, throughout the time, I presented AAP conferences, uh, actually spoke uh, to some of the folks at local AAP, some of the young professionals talking about sustainability and sustainable communities, which is some of the work I do here at SMUD. And then my connection with Chris, like you said, we were in the same firm. Uh, I was in Northern California. He was in Southern California. He was the guy I was trying to be like because um, he was just, you know, the young, super smart, new policy, you know, like the back of his hand. So. I, Chris was always kind of the person I was trying to be like, and then we got a chance to work in the same office and become friends. And I consider Chris a friend. We were also uh, in fantasy football for a number of years. Um, I don't think he ever really beat me, but I'll let him talk about that. And then we also had the honor of coaching a, a basketball team together, his daughter's basketball team. And it's a lot of fun. Chris is uh, as crazy as a, a professional consultant working, doing a lot of great work for SMUD, even better man and, and, and better dad. So glad to call him a friend. I actually met Jose at one point where I think I had to have my head shaved and Jose still has the pictures of that. So (laughs) I was hoping you wouldn't say that. (laughs) We got to see that picture now. So uh, we had to follow up with you for that. (laughs) I got to find about five Uh, flip phones ago to find that. (laughs) 
aging yourself there a little bit. Um, (laughs) so, okay. I thank you guys so much for sharing. It's so fun to see the different paths and how you guys connected and how your lives is intersected and continue to, um, within the industry and personally as well. And so I think if we could get both of you just, um, a little bit of background on your, where your positions are, are right now. And so Chris, we can start with you. What's your current role and, and what are you doing? What's your day job? So I am a principal and the environmental practice group leader at Ascent Environmental. Um, we do sequinipa work kind of throughout the state. I'm based out of Sacramento. Um, we're currently about 100 people. Um, right now, I'm, I'm working a lot with the UC and CSU system, helping them with uh, campus master planning efforts, long range development plans, um, a lot of new student housing on campuses, um, which is kind of exciting, like trying to trying to cut down on, on students living in the local community and actually getting them more on campus. Um, but uh, let's see how I, how I started out in this. Um, I'll just touch on that really quick because um, I, I think it was kind of fun and, and leads to how Jose and I got to know each other. Um, I actually had zero experience throughout my resume like 30 different times. Um, got a hit at ESA under a uh, a woman named Wendy Lockwood, who actually, I'm pretty sure to this day, hired me because I said I fully expect to do grunt work. And that was 23 years ago. And and this is where I am today. It pays off to be honest in the interview process, (laughs) just to get your foot in the door. No, it's a great story. Uh, uh, So my current role at the Sacramento Municipal Utility District, known as SMUD in Sacramento as well. Um, I'm currently uh, serving as the interim chief diversity officer for SMUD um, and have matriculated through a number of roles there. But within my team, um, we have our our people services and strategies group, which handles our human resources, our change management work, um, and our uh, recruitment work uh, for SMUD. We also have our sustainable communities group, which works on holistic sustainability. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that from an environmental perspective, but also for quality of life from an economic perspective, mobility perspective, and social well-being uh, perspectives. We do a lot of education work, nonprofit work, uh, and, and traditional sustainability work as well. Uh, and then we also have our, our diversity, equity, and inclusion group, which really focuses on both the internal and external applications of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, and particularly as we talk about things like environmental justice, we've really been leveraging a lot of the data and technology we have to ensure that as SMUD moves towards, so we're really focused on our zero carbon 2030 um, goal and vision and ensuring that not just our operations are at zero carbon levels, but that we can also bring the whole community around along with that, that vision, really focusing on underserved and under-resourced communities. So my team really is a, a big part of ensuring that the community is a part of that process. Uh, so it's a lot of a lot of alignment with my environmental like core core work that I've done for the majority of my career, but also a lot of the volunteer and nonprofit work. So I'm, I'm kind of living the dream. And, and the short answer to, to what Chris said about how I got here, um, the Cliff Notes version, again, very little experience worked in an office, uh, met Mr. Brian Mooney. And, and uh, as I had an opportunity to go in a different direction of career, what Brian said is if, if, if you go into the environmental planning space, you will see the world differently and it will really offer you more opportunity to grow in your career than anything else. Now, he, did, he, he didn't pay a lot up front, but what he did is he paid an experience. Um, and it was from that foundation, started off with his company, Mooney & Associates, Moved to Sacramento, started at EIP Associates, where Chris and I were colleagues in the Northern and Southern California office. Then I transferred over to SMUD, started off as an environmental specialist there and matriculated to supervise the secret group there and then ultimately the overall, manage the overall environmental group there. And that's where I did a lot of work with Chris, who brought in his team as a consultant to do amazing work for SMUD. So that's kind of the, the clip notes version of how we got here and what we're doing right now. That's a beautiful growth story. I love it. Starting all the way from 101, moving up to be a CEQA manager, director of sustainable communities and interim chief diversity officer. I mean, that is leadership in a very awesome trajectory. My question to you, Jose, is, well, firstly, before I get into the question, I didn't want to give a shout out to Brian again, because he did at the AEP conference in Yosemite this year, win the Lifetime Achievement Award from AEP and it was well-deserved, well-earned, lots of tears in the audience. And we're so grateful to have him um, in our industry because look at what he's brought in. He's guided and mentored the future leaders of our industry who are 
I'm, I'm now I'm hearing you say like, not only are you a leader in the industry, but you also do a lot of nonprofit work and some philanthropy and give back. So you mentioned um, how Brian said, becoming an environmental planner, you'll see the world differently. Is that why you joined the environmental profession or what was, what was the reason why behind environmental work instead of some other industry? It's a great question. Um, I actually had another job on the table that was paying a lot more than what Brian was offering. Um, but what, what Brian convinced me in the process was that I would have the opportunity to impact how communities are built and how people live their lives. Uh, and then when he started going into the CEQA process in terms of how it can be used, not just as, as a regulatory tool, but as a tool to enhance the outcomes of a project. And, and he really did a lot of work in South East, Southeast San Diego, and really maximize the scoping components of CEQA and going beyond the minimum uh, thresholds and really embedded that in terms of my core, core competencies about how do you make sure you leverage the community to make a project better from an environmental standpoint across the board. And so AEP was a great mechanism of learning best practices from some of the best in the business. Um, to understand the different contexts that different communities had had to exist within. Um, and so really, Brian would encourage all of us to, to, to sharpen our tools from a professional development standpoint. And AEP was a great place to learn that. And for me, coming in kind of green, it was a great place for me to learn the fundamentals at, at a strong level because I could write. I was a good writer, but I didn't understand necessarily some of the more technical components of the process. So um Brian definitely uh, deserves that award because there's a whole number of us that all came from his shop and we've all done pretty good. And uh, I think we all got a chance to say our thank yous in that video, but hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, perfect. And and Chris, why the environmental profession for you? Wow. Um, I mean, I, I think huh, this is dating way back to even watching the movie Free Willy as a kid. Like I always had some sort of conservation thing in my mind. Um, and it's, it's always just been, been a, a piece for me. Um, but I, I will totally admit coming out of college, I was like, well, what am I going to do? I, I originally was thinking I was going to go work for the California Coastal Commission. Um, but then I ended up accidentally getting an apartment and there's a whole story behind that accidentally getting an apartment in Santa Monica when the Coastal Commission's office in Long Beach. And I'm like, I don't want to go down the 405 every day like that. That's going to be horrible. Um, so I started looking at private consulting and, and I, I kind of gave you the, the, the Wendy Lockwood story. Um, but when I got into this, I mean, as Jose mentioned, you, you pick up a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and I think one of the biggest lines, and this was from easily 15 years ago that somebody told me that always kind of sticks with me. There's so much in this industry to learn um, that the biggest, the biggest thing you need to carry with you is knowing what you don't know and being okay with that, but knowing where to get it from. So that's that's kind of been my mantra as I've moved through my career um, and then just trying to learn as much as I can. Um, I'll, last thing I'll throw in is in terms of outside the industry perspectives, one funny story is I really pissed off my real estate agent when I would ask all sorts of questions that no one else apparently would ever ask. Where I'm like, oh, what's the what's the property behind this zone since there's nothing developed there? And she's like, well, I, I don't know. And, and I'm like, well, how much traffic is anticipated on that on that roadway over there? And she's like, I don't know that question or the answer to that question. So that just gives you a little bit of some of the things you pick up just by working in this industry for a while that you can apply to your life. Um, yeah, absolutely, Chris. And that was a really good tee up for another episode we're doing in our CEQA series of this podcast where we're going to interview a real estate developer. And we'll have to ask them, what are some of the most annoying questions you've received from environmental planners as you're trying to develop? Um, but back to Jose, um, you've been the director of sustainable communities. I'm really interested in hearing what is your slash SMUD's definition of sustainability and where do you, what do you think it's evolving into? That's a great question. Uh, uh, and maybe give a little bit of context. Even before I became director of sustainable communities, when I was managing our environmental group, we developed SMUD's first sustainability report. Um, and so we were mostly focusing on environmental sustainability in terms of how we do our work, how we handle our trips, and, and being able to provide that information and, and provide some mitigation to improve. But when we looked at sustainability from an environmental health perspective by itself, we were recognizing that different communities, different socioeconomic areas, different demographic areas were experiencing 
uh, uh, more severe impacts from some of the same resources um, than others. And we were seeing the intersectionality between environmental health and education and food deserts and what have you. So when we started looking at sustainability at SMUD and started the Sustainable Communities Initiative, we really wanted to build around four pillars that we believed contributed to holistic sustainability, which we define as having a quality of life that would allow you and your children to be able to live, work, play within the ecosystem of the neighborhood you live in. And so we really do focus on environmental health as being primary number one, number two, uh, access to social services, and social well-being, so access to good schools, access to parks, access to safe walkways. Um, number three, we look at mobility, having safe mobility alternatives there. Um, and that's not just electric car chargers, which is a component, but it's, again, walking paths. It's access to, to transit. It's access to shaded walk paths. Um, and then the fourth for us is the economic access. Is Does your community have jobs within the area that you live? Do you have to drive 40 minutes like Chris talked about or even longer in LA traffic to get to a, a good place of employment. And if we don't check all four of those boxes, we're going to see some of the end effects in terms of poverty, in terms of health, in terms of asthma that are trying, driving communities to, towards a, a, an unsustainable component. So that's how we look at it and where we see it's going. And again, there's a lot of the ESJ conversation it, it, that's definitely to me is, is, is really that holistic view of sustainability is what we're going to all have to get to. But I do think that it's, it's one of those things where data tells the story. And uh, we have a sustainable communities resource priorities map that we've prepared and created for the Sacramento region that really helps explain why certain neighborhoods, it's not an accident that the asthma rates are high and that the school quality is low and that they're connected because we actually compile all that data in one location. So that's how we're trying to look at sustainability at SMUD is, is really from a holistic quality of life perspective. And if I could just chime in and put Jose and, and SMUD a little bit up on a pedestal here. If you haven't taken a look at that sustainable communities map, then you can just Google search it, SMUD sustainable communities map. Um, it is this GIS map that you can play around with that has multiple inputs where they've kind of aggregated the data, sorted it, and prioritized. So some of the stuff that's in there is like Cal Enviro stores. So actually looking at where the health risks are. And, and as Jose mentioned, you know, access to certain things, access to transit. And they've come up with kind of these, these shadings of, of where communities that, that might not be getting as much as they, as they should, and, and there might be some additional consideration and, and contributing to them being actual sustainable communities where that focus might need to be. Um, and I think it's just a, it's a great tool. I use it on projects in the Sacramento region probably at least once or twice a month, and then aren't just SMUD projects. I just pulled it up uh, as you were speaking. I'm embarrassed to say I didn't know this existed. Now I'm stoked on it. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. And to add to like, we will post this in the description of the podcast. So for anyone listening, we'll make it easy to access. Oh, and, and I appreciate the kind words and, and our, our IT team, they're geniuses because it's one of those things where you say, you asked that, that big hairy audacious goal, like, Hey, could we do? And they pulled it off. And what's really exciting is they're working on a version two. Uh, that's going to be coming out in the fall that includes even more inputs since we have updated Cal and virus screen data that has more demographic information. And it's really a tool that anybody in the community can use to find a way to help address issues of sustainability. So we use it, for example, when we work with nonprofits, well, where should we focus some of our efforts as it relates to um, tree canopy? Well, we have a tree canopy layer that we can overlay and we can say, oh, wow, let's work with the Sacramento Tree Foundation on a project here in Meadowview. Um, or if we're working with Chris as an environmental consultant and we're addressing issues related to Native American heritage, um, is there information that we have that we can provide support to a nonprofit that addresses issues in that community? So it, it's definitely something that we're really proud of. Uh, a lot of people uh, work a lot of hours to make it work. And we're really, the, the big goal for us is to share it. So even if you're outside of Sacramento, we're happy to share how we put it together because we want to make sure that all of our industry can can, can find ways to achieve uh, holistic sustainability. So thanks for the plug, Chris. Appreciate that. 
And I, um, I remember studying environmental studies in university and taking my GIS classes and I was terrible. It was awful. I made the most rookie mistakes and to see how our industry has come to this level of very exciting data collection and display in ways that's really easy to understand. Um, so for the youngins out there, the students, Maybe, Jose, can you explain the connection between sustainable communities and your role as chief diversity officer and how those support or interconnect? Oh, for sure. Um, SMUD is a public community-owned uh, electric, electric electricity provider. So we have a responsibility to serve our public. Um, we have a publicly elected board. Um, we are in one of the most diverse cities and communities in the U.S., and for us to be able to address the needs of our, of our region, that means the folks in the most rural parts of our city or our county, in the most urban parts, the folks where English is a second language, um, areas where there's different areas of concentration like the map shows, we have to look at things through a DEI lens so we can make sure that the information we're sharing in the program to be developed meet the needs of our entire customer base. And so that's really why that sits under the chief diversity officer seat is that we have a responsibility from a sustainability perspective and from an operations perspective to make sure we're providing services and programs for all of our customers. And so I was really allowed having the data collection has given us more information to provide a better product for our customer um, and to reach our customers and also to have some input back. Um, so that's kind of where we see it. For us, we have our 2030 uh, zero carbon goal, and that's what we're trying to reach. How we get there is through diversity, equity, inclusion, is that we make sure that everybody has an opportunity to participate in that plan. That's beautiful. Well said. Um, and just want to give a big thanks to SMUD. It's not all the every day that you see a utilities provider provide such um, community focused engagement and services at this level of environmental planning, CEQA, engagement, diversity, et cetera. It just goes on and on. I'm very impressed. Thank well, you, Jose. Carl, I got to give some props to my friend, Mr. Mahank in a sec. Yes. Uh, they have been an amazing partner with SMUD and they've worked on, on, with us on our campus plan. They've really been a key part of all of the operations that we do. They're a phenomenal consultant. I, I, the only sad part about this job is I don't get to work with Chris every day. Um, and, and they're helping us too in terms of our work with, within the Native American community, making sure that we have, have materials and statements that properly acknowledge uh, their relationship with how we do our work within our county as there's a huge component of the cultural history and the cultural presence of our, our region. So again, this, they're not paying me. We're actually paying them. But the reality is we're paying them because they do amazing, good, amazing and good work. And, and from Chris and Alan and the rest of the team at Ascent, uh, they do an amazing job. So we couldn't get there without a great consultant like Ascent. This I'm not just shirt. I am blushing. So, so <laughs> <laughs> And th this is really nice for our student listeners, our young professional listeners to hear how environmental consultants, public agencies, the client consultant relationship can work out to have mutually beneficial um, needs, strategies, goals, and to produce something that's really beneficial to the quality of life of the community. So thank you for sharing how you guys um, work so well together. It's, it's lovely to see. So on that note, Chris, we'll wrap up with our final question. What is your dream for the environmental profession? Um, I, I think that that might be it. That, I mean, we, we we saw a little bit with that UC Berkeley legislation that came through recently. Um, I love the intention behind CEQA. Um, I, I would love to see it get a little bit of a retool. Um, I don't know if that'll ever happen. Um, I am very conservation minded um, and I'd love to see CEQA get back to that. I mean, I think there are definitely efforts that are that are in that vein. Um, I mean, and a lot of the work we do with SMUD is, is definitely there of, of, an, of environmental stewardship, environmental responsibility. Um, but yeah, I, I would really love to change CEQA just a teeny little bit. Um, so anyway, I'll leave it there. <laughs> CEQA, CEQA reform. Jose, what's your dream for the environmental profession? No, my, my dream is, is two things. It, it, one is to see more of the diversity of our region and our state reflected in our profession. 
I think that having diverse backgrounds, perspectives, experiences really adds to the quality of not just the documents that we produce, but the projects that we develop in the communities we develop. Um, I, I always kind of took pride in the fact that I wasn't an environmental science person, and it would allow me to write from a perspective of someone who maybe didn't know some of those perspectives. Um, so I would love to see this podcast and and on the YouTubes of of young people of all different backgrounds who could say, "Wow, um, maybe I can do that." Uh, and then related to that, I'd love to see us more take advantage of the outreach and community uh, engagement tools that we have. To, to make sure that the communities that we develop in really feel a part of the projects. I still feel like there's too many too many examples where folks look at CEQA as a check the box process to get through, slide it through whatever jurisdiction's approval process to get their project done. Not recognizing the value that community input beyond just the public comment period can add to a project. There's nothing better, I served on planning commission in Sacramento, there's nothing better when you can see the community and the developer behind a project all feel like they own a piece of it and and, and, and see that project thrive. I, those are my two wishes and dreams. Just real quick, if I can add on to that, because you had a great line in there. Um, and since we're kind of talking a little bit to early career professionals, one thing I will say is if you are considering this industry and, and why you might consider being an environmental professional, um, as we've kind of touched on, it's it's a whole big opportunity to learn and, and to build upon those experiences. So, if you want to learn and just come with a willingness to learn and just to adapt to different situations, um, it's just, it's a, a fun place to be. I mean, I, I, I thought about going professional or going public service. It wasn't, or not public service, public entity for a while. It, it wasn't an, an organization like SMUD, but I just decided consulting was kind of my thing just because I got this wide breadth of experience um, that you can then bring into different projects. Yes. Anyway. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for sharing. And I think that last question, your dreams for the profession just really hit on some of the key themes that we have been discussing on this podcast. So you guys just buttoned it up very nicely for us. Thank you so much. <laughs> and with that, we are going to wrap up with our wrap up rapid five. So five questions. I'll start with Chris and then go to Jose and then I'll go Jose to Chris. So I'll, I'll switch it up just a little bit to keep you on your toes. So Chris, what is your favorite daily habit? Um, hot sauce tastings with my daughter. Um, if you've oh, ever seen sorry. that show, Hot Ones. Can you repeat that one more time? Oh, Hot Ones, the hot wing show? Yeah, so... We have probably like 30 different hot sauces in my fridge and we'll just put them on chicken nuggets and we'll do different tastings. That's, that's my daily habit with her. That's amazing. Jose, favorite daily habit. I can't top that. I mean, <laughs> I, the first thing I was thinking was just eating. I mean, it's something you're required to do, but it's, I, I, I enjoy it. Yes. Necessity. All right. I love that. Okay. So I'll start with you, Jose, for this one. Three things you would take to a deserted island. Three things on a deserted island. Wow. I think number one, Wi-Fi. Um, uh, just self-explanatory. Um, two, I would take some amazing music. Uh, I think that would get me through the day. And then three, I would bring... Are we allowed to bring people? Yes. Uh, I'd bring my fiance for sure. Oh, okay. Yeah. Love it. Chris. Chris would be my fourth, just to be safe. <laughs> we only got three. I'm just you. You went fully quality of life. I I was going more survival. I I was I was going with a fishing rod, um, a multi tool, and and a solar cooker. Um, we're, we're really getting into psychology, you guys, with these questions right here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's Chris, your favorite flora or fauna? Ooh, uh, it's actually the hoary marmot. Um, that I got to see for the first time in Montana. And it was, we're hiking up to a waterfall and this little guy was just enjoying the wind, but it looked like he was doing push-ups. Um, and I sat there and must've watched him for easily 30 to 45 minutes. And I was like, yep, all right, that's it. Hori Marmot, totally my favorite animal. Great. Jose. I'm just going to say various forms of cacti. Now, while I don't have any, 
I I am a nerd. When I'm in Arizona and go to Botanical Gardens, I can be there all day. In San Diego at the uh, Balboa Park, I I drive people crazy. Like stand next to the, it's just because I'm amazed at the different the different variations, the different shapes, styles. It, it it's fascinating. Cacti are fascinating. You, you guys are fascinating. <laughs> Okay, Jose, favorite environmental policy? Favorite environmental policy. I mean, it's going to sound contrary to Chris, but I'm, I'm just going to say CEQA in general because it, it just, it it changed my life. Uh, the policy changed my life, changed how I view the world. Most of my friends and people I care about, uh, I've met and engaged with through CEQA. So it sounds simple, but I'm sticking with CEQA. Great. Chris. Yeah, honestly, we're in agreement. I mean, even though I, I preach SQL reform as my my dream for the environmental profession, it's the same kind of thing. Like I I like this industry. I mean, I, I like the possibility behind it. I like the intention behind it. I mean, if you look at when NEPA started just before CEQA, but then what CEQA has become, it's really well intentioned. Um, and I mean it's it's all about conservation for me. And so that yeah, CEQA is also my favorite environmental policy. You love CEQA and you want what's best for it. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so, Chris, uh, last question. Finish this thought. Wouldn't it be cool if? Uh, wouldn't it be cool if we were to actually be able to achieve all our GHG reduction goals in the state? Um, and I say that because I'm, I'm working with some agencies right now who are struggling with some GHG reduction goals. Um, and just in terms of renewable energy supplies, et cetera, um, it's exciting and, and a little terrifying um, about how we might actually get to those goals. But yeah, it would be cool. Great. Good luck. Keep it up. <laughs> and then Jose, wouldn't it be cool if? Uh, wouldn't it be cool if all communities could really benefit from environmental policies that um, there wouldn't be a need for environmental justice policy because we actually would be thinking about all communities in, in the forefront. That'd be pretty awesome. Yes. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. Thanks for your time and sharing your experience and expertise on the podcast. We really appreciate it. And it's been great to have you. Uh, it's definitely been a lot of fun. Can I ask a question? I'm just going off script. What, what would it be cool for you, Jessa and Laurel? Oh, oh, I wasn't ready for this one. Hey, you gotta throw curveballs. Okay, I'll go. I've got it, Jessa. Yeah. Wouldn't it be cool if education was free for women? And I would say mine is a little broad, but my wouldn't it be cool if everyone had their basic needs met? Baseline Maslow's hierarchy is how I think about it. <laughs> we just need to combine all of our wouldn't it be cool ifs, and then we'd have an incredible quality of life. I, I would say I'd be out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> you might not need one, though. You could just cruise. I would have fine. my basic needs met, though, so we'd be good. <laughs> you heard it here first. Didn't know we were going to go psychological, but I just loved it. Thank you guys so much for, for sharing. We hope we get to have you back, back again and tell more stories. Sure, we're, we're full of them. So, no, no problem. <laughs> I, 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 I could talk four hours about Chris. So, all right. <laughs> well, thank you guys up on that. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of your afternoon. You too. Take care. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode. As a new podcast, it really helps us if you share with friends and colleagues that may enjoy this podcast as well. And please subscribe or follow the podcast to be alerted for new episodes. If you want to submit a shout out, please send a voice memo that's under one minute to podcast at C-A-L-I-F-A-E-P dot org. That's podcast with an S at the end, podcast at C-A-L-I-F-A-E-P dot org. Or please send any feedback you'd love to share. Thank you.